All right, here we are at the advent of a new year. So we're going to start a new series, and I'm excited about it, even though it has a title that's a little scary. Uh, Because this week and for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about an issue that I'm sure a lot of you have come into contact with as you have tried to follow Jesus and be faithful in a local church. And the title of the series is Church Hurt. So we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. And if you're here this morning for this series, I've just got to let you know that you're not going to get all the information or you're not going to download everything that we have to say on the topic in in these 30 or 40 or more minutes together. But you're going to uh, really want to be a part of this. This week we're going to do a big overview and then kind of dive in next week. So Christmas is past, right? All the ornaments are up and boxed up and all the trappings and all the trimmings are, are in the garage. They're in the storage room. They are, they are where they belong, right? Yeah, me neither. But we will get there, I promise. And, and I love that season. I, I love um, all that it means. I get it. We make it far too materialistic. We do. We fall into those traps. But we generally do it out of, a, out of a good heart. We're just trying to bring joy to our loved ones and, and kind of get trapped up in the nostalgia. And, and some of you guys have got it figured out, right? Uh, I was having lunch with a couple uh, this past week. And, and as soon as Christmas has passed, they clean out their kids' rooms and anything uh, that is, is not played with anymore, right? All that stuff is going on Facebook Marketplace or eBay. They figured it out, right? Nothing new comes in until something old goes out, but I'm way too sentimental for that, so we kind of keep everything. So even though the kids are older and we're not playing with toys anymore, I could pull out, I don't know, I could pull out this and kind of remember when. So some of you guys on the front row have to help them out. This is, anybody? It's Legos, right? And very specifically, it's Batman, right? It's a Batmobile, and I can remember this thing cost, like, a big box, big price tag, Got it out of the box. Kid put it together in five minutes and it's like 12 inches. This is just tiny, right? Like, wow. Played with it for a little bit. Went on the shelf. It is literally covered in dust. For the joy of our children, right? And it is pretty cool. The kids get to build and create and be creative and be inventive. Or they could follow the instructions and, and do this. And if your kids were like my kids, Legos were in our house and we enjoyed them. We enjoyed watching them play with it and the smiles on their faces. But if you had Legos in your home, like we had Legos in our home, invariably these things got busted up and scattered. Not in a toy box and not on a shelf, but on the floor. So that at 2 in the morning, we would be walking from point A to point B. And at 2 in the morning, I don't wear shoes. You might in your house. And you come across this. This is, anybody? A physics lesson. It is. It's a physics lesson that teaches if you take the square area of an object, multiply that times mass and force, it will equal pain and lots of pain. Like we, so how is it? That something that is intended for our good and our happiness and our joy, how is it that something that we love and can be nostalgic about can lead to hurt? Well, if it's true of Legos, it's absolutely true about weightier, more important things. And if you and your journey are like me and my journey, as you have drawn near to Jesus... And tried to be faithful to him by being involved and be a part of a local church. Invariably, that church or the people in it have hurt you. I know I've experienced church hurt in this journey. And I'm confident and I'm certain that most of you have as well. So let's just define some definitions. Define some definitions. That was was not good English. Let's set forward a few definitions. When we say church hurt, we are referring to the kind of things that unfortunately a lot of us have experienced. The feeling of of being excluded. or, Or being disappointed by our spiritual leaders. That sense of alienation or not having our voices being heard. Or experiencing the results of sinful attitudes and sinful actions of other people. If you've been in church long enough, to some degree, you've experienced these things. The church may have hurt you. 
And churches can do damage. These churches that are established by our Lord and given to us as a gift for our good, for his glory, and for our joy can do damage. They can do harm. They can be the ubiquitous red Lego on the floor. Churches do damage when they fail to embrace people or love people. They do damage when they fail to care for people or support them. Churches do damage when they fail to help people grow in their faith or to connect them to the larger purpose of what God is doing. Church hurt, ultimately, through the course of this series, we're going to define and see and deal with as a discipleship problem. We believe very sincerely that all the problems within the church are ultimately discipleship problems. Therefore, all of our answers have to be discipleship answers. So the scope of the series, in the next three weeks, we'll discuss what Scripture prescribes if we've been hurt in the church community. And we're going to talk about what we can do together to prevent church hurt in the future. But before we get there, we have to set forward a pastoral and theological framework to operate from. Now, I also want to be clear that when we talk about church hurt, we are not, we are not talking about events where people are victims of crimes. I wish we didn't have to say it in the church, but it needs to be said. That a church must, and this church will, report crimes to legal authorities. We will not hesitate or apologize for protecting children and honoring women. Period. But when we talk about church hurt in this series, we're also not talking about issues of mental health. We all need a support network of friends and family, of mentors and coaches, of pastors. But we also periodically need the support and help of medical professionals, such as licensed counselors and physicians. Your pastors will always encourage you to seek all the support and help that you need. And there should be no stigma in getting medical help for medical problems. All that being said, we also have to acknowledge, and when we turn to Scripture, we will see that being hurt by the local church and the people in it is not a new phenomenon. Nor are you in isolation if you've been hurt by the church. You're not alone. Look together, look with me at the words of the Apostle Paul. Turn in our Bibles, and if you don't have one, it'll be on the screen, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We are going to read what for me is one of the loneliest passages in Scripture. And we're going to pray. We're going to dive in and get to work. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. Apostle Paul, writing to his protege Timothy, a young man that he's given great spiritual responsibility to, at perhaps the very hour or hours of his Apostle Paul's death says this. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Dalatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark. And bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus, I've sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. And also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. In my first defense, 
No one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was, I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for these words that are ancient and sacred and true. And we believe when we read this book, we hear your voice. So you've spoken to us. Loudly and clearly and pastorally, O oh Lord, we recognize these words. To some degree, we can identify with these words. They're lonely words, they're hurting words. They're words that ought not have to be written about the church, but here they are, O Lord, and we thank you for them. That our brother Paul walked down this road, that you and your providence have preserved these words for us so that we today, dealing with very real hurt, can hear them, Identify with him and know that you are meeting us exactly where we are. Lord, I do not pretend to be equal to the task of this series. It's weighty and we bring our hurts and we bring our baggage and we bring our pain and we bring our wounds before you, Lord. And we just acknowledge that you alone, you alone are the one who can deal with church hurt, both in its healing and its prevention. And I pray, Lord, you would bless this message, those that follow. Lord, so that we can deal with this and be the church you have called us and purposed us to be. Don't let me injure these people, dear Lord, or abuse this text. Honor the reading of your word. Holy Spirit, Use it to change us. We pray this in Christ's name. And amen. I want you to see in this passage why I find it so poignant, why I find it so applicable in beginning a dialogue with you about being hurt by the local church. In this passage, we see that Paul is faced with... Now, this is Paul. Let's just kind of get our minds around that. Paul the apostle, the witness to the resurrected Christ, who was taught the gospel by the resurrected Christ himself, who had fellowship with the apostles and stood among them as their equal. Paul, who was bold enough to confront Peter face to face in heated conversation when Peter would step back or step away from the gospel into legalism. Paul, who abandoned his education and had to leave his family and had to leave his culture, who changed his very name to travel among Gentiles, to travel the world under peril and duress, being stoned and shipwrecked, sick and in prison. This Paul, who put Christ and his gospel and his glory above every Everything else, this Paul comes to the end of his life not in triumph. He is not on a pedestal. He is not adored by the masses. He doesn't have an audience and a microphone and a spotlight. This Paul is in prison awaiting execution and he writes these words... And we see what he's really dealing with. Paul is faced with abandonment. Look at verses 10 and 16. He says, Demas, this is the same Demas mentioned throughout his writings, a faithful companion. Demas was more in love with the world than with Jesus and that mission. And he deserted Paul. Look at verse 16. Paul says, as I stood before the legal authorities at my first defense, no one, no one 
came to stand beside me, but all deserted me. Sometimes we can feel church hurt when we feel abandoned. We go through a hard part, a hard journey, a hard moment in life. We deal with the loss of a job. We deal with the loss of a spouse. We deal with struggle. We deal with hurt. The church will come alongside for a moment. Our friends will come alongside us for a moment. Pray for us, encourage us, bring us a casserole. But as the moment turns into days and weeks and months of struggle, of hurt, we, like Paul, can feel abandoned. If you feel abandoned, if you've ever felt abandoned by the church, so did Paul. We see that Paul was faced with physical needs being unmet. This is a remarkable A remarkable word from the pen of Paul. When we read in verse 13, what seems like a throwaway line. But when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and the books and above else, all the parchments. Here we have the great missionary, the apostle Paul. In prison and alone. And as he's writing out his needs and its request... It gets real very quick. Winter's coming. I don't have the clothing necessary to survive. But I left a coat in Troas. Could you bring it? Apostle Paul, who's writing the very word of God... His letters received as scripture. He writing, believing that it's scripture. Writing these words out saying, I need the aids that I use to study. The books and the parchments. Doesn't have a copy of the Old Testament in front of him. Basic needs and necessities of life. Basic needs and necessities to carry out his mission. As goes, I don't have what I need. And the people around me haven't met my needs. I'm writing to you, Timothy, because I need I need your help. Sometimes we have not felt needs. A felt need is I don't like the blue chairs, I wish they were red, right? A felt need is I don't like the carpet, it's a little too whatever. Let's let's change it up a little bit. Felt needs are, here we go, this or that musically is not my, my cup of tea. Felt needs are, pastor's not wearing a tie, or maybe he does wear a tie, not my, not my thing. It's a felt need. Paul's talking about real needs, and maybe you've been there too. Where you've been part of a family of faith for so long, giving and contributing of your time and your energy and your treasure and your talents, and something happens and you find yourself in need, and no one around you comes to your aid. If you've experienced that, so did Paul. We see in verse 14 that Paul faced direct personal opposition. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. Beware of him yourself, verse 15. For he strongly opposed our message. The same Paul who was bold enough to stand and point at the Apostle Peter and said, man, you're abandoning the gospel for legalism. You've got to fix this and make it right. The same Paul faced direct opposition for the gospel among most of the churches that he planted. In fact, that's why we have most of Paul's letters. The gospel was preached. People believed. Churches sprang up. Paul went on to continue the mission and what happened? Feckless leaders for their own gain and for their own priorities swooped in and replaced the gospel with something else. They opposed Paul. Maybe sometimes we have only tried to stand up for what we think is right or better than what we think is right, we've stood up in defense of the gospel only to find ourselves shouted down. That's a kind of hurt that some of us have experienced in the local church. You are not alone. So did Paul. 
Paul was met and we see in this passage with every kind of church hurt that we can imagine. And as we're going to see in the next three weeks throughout the New Testament, we see Paul and the other writers of the New Testament addressing what to do and what happens and what we can do to prevent this phenomenon of people within the church doing harm to their brothers and sisters in Christ. But the passage also contains what Paul does to deal with this. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Paul doesn't deal with church hurt the way that I have dealt with church hurt in the past. And yeah, we're going to share some stories together and we're going to get real together. Do we still say that? Get real with each other? Boy, I'm a child of the 70s, 80s, 90s with my language sometimes. But we're going to have to share some real stories about what Sherry and I have been through. Maybe we'll share some stories um, together about some of the things you guys have been through. Because Paul is being very honest about what he went through. I don't deal with it the way he did. Somebody hurts me. What is the number one instinct? Hurt him back. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And if not that, if not retaliation, then alienation. They hurt me. I'm going to. Oh, it's a big room. Go sit somewhere else. Got a lot of small groups around. You hurt me, find another group. A lot of churches in town. You hurt me. Paul doesn't react that way. Paul in prison deals with all of that hurt with, well, in verse 10 and 15, we see he deals with it with a concern for the well-being of others. He's abandoned, he's left alone, and there's this beautiful little throwaway sentence in in verse 10. The second sentence of verse 10, that's amazing. For Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So I want to get my friends, the people who are on my team, and bring them closer. He doesn't do it. What does he do? He takes faithful disciples like Crescens and Titus, and he sends them out to continue the mission. I've been abandoned, I'm alone, but I'm more concerned that people hear the gospel than my needs get met. So, I'm going to take my brothers who are faithful and send them on mission. And in verse 15, as he's talking about Alexander the coppersmith, it's not, he did me harm, I'm angry with him. If he shows up, give him a piece of your mind. No. He cautions them and he warns them. He's concerned about the spiritual health of the church and tells him, beware of him yourself. For he strongly opposed our message. And what we hear in those words are, he's opposed to the gospel. Paul deals with church hurt with this overwhelming concern for other people. He deals with it with forgiveness. In verse 16, he says, At my first defense, no one came to stand beside me, but all deserted them. And I hope they go take a long walk off a short pier. He doesn't say that. Hope you guys get together and give them a... He doesn't say that. What does he say? May it not be charged against them. He deals with some of these failings and some of these fallings and some of the disappointment he has with the brethren by saying, guys, I, I just want them to be forgiven. We see Paul deals with his church hurt with an overwhelming reliance on God. An overwhelming reliance on the God. Look at, look, at, look at verse 17. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. And so through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me. The Lord will rescue me. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his kingdom. He's awaiting execution. He's not telling Timothy it's time to get the boys together and have a jailbreak. He's not saying, please take together a collection and post my bail. The Lord will rescue me Not from prison. I want you to hear that. That's what he's saying. The Lord will rescue me, not from the executioner's sword. The Lord will rescue me, not from the moment of persecution. The Lord will 
rescue me and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul deals with his church hurt by being concerned for others, by forgiving others, by relying upon the Lord. He deals with his church hurt. See this, don't miss this. By asking others in the church for help. First sentence of this passage. Hey, Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, 9. Do your best to come to me soon. I get it. The church can be a real source of of hurt. For you and for me. It can be the Lego on our journey. It can sting. It can cause pain. The The church can do more harm than that. People in the church can do more harm than that. It's real. And I'm not saying it's not. We're going to try to not answer these questions or deal with these things in the next three weeks simply by throwing a bumper sticker slogan over it. But the measure of help for overcoming church hurt, the measure of grace from the Lord that you need to walk through that pain and to deal with it and to overcome it. No matter how mad you get at a local church, the resources and the help from the Lord that you need is probably also found there in the church. Paul's hurt by the church and he goes to the church for help. May it be so with us. Now quickly, theological framework, because I think we need one. I think we need to understand and have a view of the church that's going to help us in the next three weeks to deal with these issues. So I'm going to get theological for a minute with you. Okay? We're going to go through a lot of passages on the screen. You're going to want to make reference of these. But I think it's necessary. Too often, we have been conditioned and trained. We've been discipled. In the 20th and 21st century American Western church to be consumers as we approach the local church. Okay? I think one of the reasons maybe we get hurt by the church and we don't deal with church hurt or we allow our churches to hurt people and not deal with that is simply because of this. We have a poor theological, we have a poor biblical understanding of why church in the first place. We even say it. I've said it. You've said it. We've said it together. I come to church because this is where I recharge my batteries. Okay? I've said it, you've said it, we've said it. I come to church because this is where I get my needs fed. You've said it, I've said it, we've said it. I come to church to get what I need for the next week. You've said it, I've said it, we've said it. And the degree of which we believe that and buy into that and make that the number one priority, we become consumers of a product, not members of, The body of Christ. And these are very different ideas. So when we say we need a theological, a biblical framework of the church, here's what we're going to say, a few points, and we will be done. We need to hold a high or a spiritual view of the church. Matthew 16, 18. The Lord is teaching to his disciples. Peter has made a confession that you are the Lord's Christ, the Messiah, the promised one who will save Israel and his people from sin. The Lord speaks to Peter and says, I will tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail Against it. Folks, the church is important because it's Jesus' idea. It's not like on the backside of the resurrection event, a group of Christians got together and said, Boy, it would be cool if we had an institution like we had when we were still in the synagogue. Wouldn't it be great if we just took synagogue and brought it forward and I don't know, call it a church instead, and that's we'll just we'll replicate, we'll duplicate what no. We believe the church is a spiritual thing that the Lord founded. Ephesians 5, Paul goes as far to say that the Lord died for the church. It's something that Jesus loves. It's something that Jesus calls us all to as his followers. 
We have to have a higher view of church than we do. It is not a product to consume. Right? It's not a box of Cheerios. It's not a club membership. It's not a gym membership. That this is Jesus' idea. He establishes it. He calls us to it for a purpose. And that purpose is not ours, it's his. We need a high view of the church. We also need a local view of the church. Because way back then, I would say things like maybe you've said sometimes. That I get it. When I, when I become a follower of Jesus, when I get saved, I become a part of the universal church. So now I've got to find a local church to identify with or not. Whether I'm sitting there or sitting there or sitting at home or sitting in a deer stand. I am part of, I said it. I am a part of the universal church. The only problem with that is the Bible. Like that's an awesome idea. But the Bible. And but the Bible does this. It only ever explains the universal church in terms of a local church. We see it throughout and had a laundry list of verses and we just don't have time. Romans 16, 16 will put it succinctly enough. As Paul is rounding out this letter, this grand theological treatise, what is the gospel and how do we live it out? He says to his friends living in Rome, all the churches of Christ greet you. What does he mean? He means in Galatia, there are a whole bunch of churches and they're local. They have leaders and they have members. And they know who they are and they know where they belong. That in Thessalonica, there are all these local churches. They have leaders and they have members and they know where they belong. And in Jerusalem, there are all these local churches with leaders and members and they know to whom they belong. And yes, you too, all the way over in Rome, have leaders and members and you know the universal church in the New Testament only ever is expressed as a local church. Therefore, to us to step in and say, I can express the church in a universal way without engaging or belonging locally makes a mockery of the clear biblical record. Third, we need a family view of church. Boy, we need this. We use this language a lot at Gillianville Baptist Church. I'm going to talk about a family of faith an awful lot. And that's not meant to be a a, a coffee mug slogan or a bumper uh, sticker you know, slogan. It's meant to be something that we really get our minds around and start to live out. And to a great degree, we don't. The church is meant to be a family. As Jesus establishes his church, he knows. I'm dragging these people away from everything they've ever known. To a a Jewish woman 2,000 years ago living in, in Israel... She's now going to become a disciple, a follower of Jesus. She's going to lose. She's going to lose family. She's going to lose reputation. She's going to lose standing in the community. To that man living in Ephesus who starts to follow Jesus, he's going to lose. He's going to lose his family. He's going to lose his livelihood. He's going to lose his reputation. It's going to cost him. To those, to those children living in Rome. They're going to start following Jesus and Nero is going to lose his mind and he's going to murder them. To my brothers and sisters right now in China who are who knows where, in prison or a re-education center or dead, following Jesus calls people out of everything they know. It's a loss. So Jesus in his mercy gives us the church. Matthew 19, 29, our Lord says, and everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands, for my name's sake, they will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. The Lord gives us each other in the church, to be a family. Not acquaintances. Not, you know, worship buddies. I raise my hands, they raise their hands. We were the same. No, man, he gives us to be family. I'm glad we're doing this on the back end of the holiday season. Christmas and Thanksgiving, because we get family. Family are the people we draw around the table that time of year. That's our tribe. That's who we belong to. 
And if your family's like my family, man, I got some crazy uncles. We sat around Thanksgiving talking about the crazy uncles. It was awesome. It's pretty cool. Because if we're talking about the crazy uncles, that means I'm not him. So yay. And even though we've got those, those, those in-laws and outlaws, the crazy uncles and the eccentric aunts, we are still a family together, folks. I get it. Not everybody in this room is a golfing buddy. Some of them cheer for Georgia Tech. But we are, really? I can't get a laugh out of that? But we are, fa- literally, there is no one sitting around our tech grad in the back of the room. It's, just, it's killing me now. Just notice that. We are, that's wrong. I need a picture of that. We are, for all of our differences, family together. And that's the Lord's design. When you have a family view of the church, we need to have a missional view of the church. Ephesians 3, 7. Paul says, and one day I will preach from this passage of the gospel. I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power to me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is plain of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Okay, a lot of words and we cannot unpack the meaning of this but it's powerful. It's beautiful. Is that through the church... Through the church, the Lord is making his glory and the mysteries of the gospel known. Here on earth and even in the heavens beyond. We need a missional view of the church that we're not called to simply occupy space in a building and we push it way more than we should. Like the end game is to have a big crowd in this room that would be great but that's not the goal the goal is this church together we are on mission as individuals wherever God puts us in our lives on mission to make much of his name and to share his gospel with as many people as we have opportunity we need to have finally finally a practical view of the church Philippians 4 15 and you Philippians You Philippians yourselves know that the Apostle Paul says, In the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Okay, maybe not the most spiritual of verses to end on, but here's the implication, here's the idea. That is spiritual and as high a view of the church that we have, we also need to have a really practical view that when we say the church, we're talking about people. We're talking about real people. In real situations, doing real things in real neighborhoods and communities and real families. Then when we talk about church hurt, it's not in a vacuum. It means the person sitting left of you or right of you, across the room for you, sitting at home. Even though they were in church for who knows how many years before. People in the church have wounded them and hurt them. Have been stumbling blocks to them on their journey. Some of you guys don't want to some of you guys don't want to be here. You just don't. You've been hurt by the church, you've been burned by the church, you are empty, you are lonely, you feel isolated, you don't even know why you got out of bed this morning to come to this place. You're not alone. You're not in isolation. This is not new. You hear in Paul's words. To his son of the faith, Timothy, maybe exactly where you have been. And we together ought to acknowledge and know that the church as an institution is not at work there. It's we, the church, as individual people that have allowed that. And sometimes we've caused that. And we need to change and to elevate how we view what we're doing here, what the church is biblically, so that we begin again the road and the journey to healing and to preventing all those kinds of hurt. 
So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to sing one last song. It's what we do. This is an in-house discussion. You guys have probably picked up on that. We're talking about Christians and believers hurting Christians and believers, but there are people here that are neither of those things. You wouldn't dare carry the, the label Christian over your head as a banner. Or maybe even if you do, the truth is you don't know, you don't belong to Jesus. We always give that opportunity. For you to come and talk to a pastor and have a dialogue. Not to embarrass you. Not to walk an aisle. We actually go into a room and sit down and talk. Maybe. Maybe you're bringing hurt into this room. You've been hurt. You've been hurt by the church. Uh, church as our music team goes in and makes it up. And gets set up. You've been hurt. And you're just carrying around that pain and that baggage. And you need to begin a process. Begin a journey of healing. It's not going to be through me. It's going to be through taking it, first and foremost, before the Lord. Maybe there's another burden, something else on your heart, whatever it is. Our pastors will be down front. Our deacons are going to open up a room to the side where you can step out and talk. Sitting where you are, you can deal with what the Lord has placed on your heart. So let me pray for us. Let's stand together. Let's sing one last song.